name is Roger Chevalier, and I've been in ISBI for over 20 years. I actually worked full-time for them for five years, where uh, I was originally put in charge of like a book program, and then they found out that I could teach. Next thing you know, I'm on the road again, and uh, working with a lot of large corporations. It was, it was a great job, and I uh, really enjoyed it, but uh, when I took the job, I told my boss that I'll be here five years. He said, how do you know that? I said, you're in the middle of my 10-year plan. And uh, I said, what are you going to do after the five years? I said, well, I'm going to write a book and uh, put that out. And that's this Improving Workplace Performance book. And uh, uh, it's, um, it's the cheapest book in the bookstore, by the way. <laughs> it usually sells more than any other book, I think, for that reason. You know, if you're down to your last 20 bucks, that's, that's the one to get. But the reason why I publish with the American Management Association is, number one, the target audience is managers, and that's what that book is for. It takes the ideas like the ones we're going to work with today and brings them down to a manager's level. I find I really do work with two sets of groups right now. Uh, one is uh, large corporations and their instructional design teams as they're moving towards uh, broader analysis and multiple solutions that we use in performance improvement. Uh, the other group is uh, companies where they bring me in to work with their managers. So I've got, really those are the two target audiences that I work to. But the book is really designed for managers. Today we're going to be talking about the role of the consultant for using some of those tools. Um, my background, 20 years in the Coast Guard, and that's what got me started in the training business. And uh, the last 15 years of my 20-year career, I did nothing but train people or administer the training function. So it was a wonderful career and groomed me well for the next one. And I was consulting even while I was in with uh, Century 21 Real Estate and uh, moved in as a vice president for a couple of years and then they got moved to the east coast and it took me long enough to find the west coast so I didn't go with them. Uh, actually it was one of those things where out of 200 people at the headquarters, four survived. <coughs> so, but those are my two major backgrounds and uh, you know, I'll draw from some of those experiences we go through. I, you know, I'm more than just an academic, I've got quite a bit of practical experience. What we're going to talk about is tools, uh, models and tools. Models are neat because they give you a framework, a structure for understanding things. And they allow you to see things in patterns because you can put things into different boxes, if you will, or different elements of a model. And uh, you can analyze and uh, see where you've got information and where you don't. So we're going to use a model that's derived from uh, Tom Gilbert's model. And, um, but what I do is I also build tools off of that. And we'll use one tool in here, but if I don't mention it at the very end, on my website there are six articles that you can download. You don't have to register or do anything weird. Just go to the website and uh, you can uh, download those six articles as PDFs, but they cover everything that I really teach at this point. But one of the, two of the articles are an advanced form of the uh, worksheet that we're going to have in here. And our act, that form is actually better for consultants. Uh, so one article talks about the development of that. And it's got an interesting track record because it started off in a course that I taught for ISBI. There was someone from the nuclear industry, actually from Info in there. He took the, uh, the uh, model and turned it into a nuclear version. Then uh, he's, you know, we traded that back and forth until he got the final version. Then I went to Vienna, Vienna Austria with uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency and try to show them my one-page worksheet. And they didn't like that so much. I showed them the model that was nuclearized. And we developed a whole different worksheet. And then I came back and made it generic. So that's kind of the evolution of this thing. And really, I started working on a job aid for managers 20 years ago. So those of you new in the business, some of these things take a while before you get them in the final format. Uh, that's me on a bike. That's just to remind you that this guy who hobbles around <laughs> still rides a bike 4,000 miles a year. And uh, it's the antidote to diabetes, by the way. And that's a picture of the book, which uh, I'll never write another one. Um, it was one of those books that was kind of in my head. And uh, I wrote it really as a series of articles uh, at our level. And then I had to break it down and write it at 11th grade reading level, because that's where managers and supervisors read. Right. And some of our consultants, too. So, um, But in any event, we uh, uh, it was uh, the first five chapters are really on leadership, and the last five are on performance improvement with a couple of case studies woven in. 
but um, it was, you know, I had, it was one of those things I had to clear out of my system so I could kind of move on. What we're going to do is we're going to, you know, look at a number of different things while we're here, but we really want to take a look at how you interact with your clients. Then we want to develop questions, and we're actually going to have an interactive role play where all of you together will be the consultant, so it's a very low risk role play or skill practice, meaning that you don't even have to get involved, you can just watch. And the, but the people who do get involved will get feedback on their questioning techniques. You know, for years, I knew that the, one of the things that you needed to do as a consultant was ask good questions. But nobody told me that you should start with an open-end question, and then when they answer that open-ended question, they're giving you information, and really when they give you that information, it gives you permission to drill down. And if you don't drill down at that point, you're actually insulting your client. Mm -hmm. So we're going to work on that a little bit, and you're going to see how it fits into a broader performance consulting model, because question techniques are only part of what we do as a performance consultant when we interact with our clients. Uh, but then we're going to talk about how we identify performance gaps, the difference between a present level of performance and a desired level of performance. All right? And we're going to build on that. And uh, we're going to look at a one-page job aid that <coughs> helps you define that performance gap, set a reasonable goal, and then do the analysis, the structured analysis of the uh, driving and restraining forces, the things that are working for you, they're already working to support where you are, but the things that are working against you. Because once you identify those, your solution is really to add more driving forces or uh, remove or mitigate the restraining forces and then they, your performance line moves towards the desired level of performance. But we'll have a one-page job aid that uh, uses force field analysis, but it's more structured than just an open-ended <laughs> force field. So that's what we're going to do. If you aren't going to do that, you're in the wrong room. So. Uh, I'm going to interact with you a little bit at this point. What are the steps you use in your consulting process right now? And the way I'm going to frame this is that if um, you got a phone call from someone, if you're uh, internal, it's another division. If you're an external, it's a potential client. And they say, I'd like to meet with you, you know, a week later. You set a time and a date. What should you do before you ever walk in the door? Yeah. Go on their website, do some research. Okay, if you're an external, we have to work from the websites. And an internal can do that too, by the way. You know, some of you don't even know the mission statements of your companies. So it's good to kind of review that and see when you're talking with them how well their problem is aligned or not aligned with where the organization is going. Uh, but certainly as an external, you know, look at the websites. There's, you can Google the person's name and they'll show up and uh, you can see what that's about. You Google my name and uh, I show up, but then there's also an astrophysicist with the same name. And I take credit for his work because I really, really like astronomy. He's written some good papers. So. Um, yeah, so I'm out of the University of Virginia as well as living in Northern California. So. But uh, you want to do your homework. What else? Yes? I ask for or look for strategic plans. Okay, yeah. If you're an internal, you can find the strategic plan. If you're an external, sometimes if there's a large enough corporation, you can download their annual report. Yeah. And they'll give you the mission statement, the vision statement, and maybe not the whole strategic plan, but you can certainly find out what they're communicating to their stakeholders. So, good. What else? Yes? Understand the objective of the meeting. Yeah. Try to get a handle on the objective of the meeting. And uh, there are different ways you can do that. Ideally, you ask a question during that first uh, uh, phone call saying, you know, can you give me a hint as to why I'm coming over? And they'll tell you a little bit about the problem. Um, but sometimes, you know, you really don't know. They just say, I really want to meet with you. And uh, um, so you got to do a little research and see what's happening in that division. And uh, there may be a way if you can start to define the problem before you ever get there. Good. Yes? Uh, probably get some information on the competitors. Yeah. Look at the competitors. Look at the industry. Yeah. Uh, particularly as an external. I was working with an electronics firm, and one of their problems was turnover. So I went to Google and found out all kinds of things about the industry and found out that, um, you know, what the average rate was for certain specialties in terms of how long they stayed in the job. Then I had some information I could add to them. When we were in the meeting, uh, they could tell I had done my homework because when they told me what their turnover rate was for a particular specialty, I looked at my list of specialties and I said, oh, the average rate is this amount. And they could tell I had done my homework. And I wasn't working for them at that point. I was just building information to write the proposal. But people are already working for you. You tend to want to hire them. So and that's whether you're an internal or an external. 
Okay, so we <coughs> want to prepare. We want to do our homework. If you read Neil Rackham's book, Spin Selling, he talks about salespeople who ask too many situation questions, the open-ended questions, and he says the reason why the new people tend to do that is they haven't done their homework. And your customers can tell whether you've done your homework by the quality of questions you ask them. Okay, so you want to earn the right to go in that door, prepare for that meeting. I've seen a lot of consultants go into meetings cold. It really doesn't work very well. Okay, now you go through the door, right? They, you know, you're at their place, their office. What do you do? Start firing off your questions? Or is there something that should be done before that? Build rapport. Yeah, build some rapport. Uh, and the way I usually do it is I try to scan the office real quickly because when people put things out, it kind of gives you permission to talk about them because they're on public display. And uh, there was a time when we were trying to sell a, I had a partner at that time, that's why I use the word we, uh, we were trying to sell a coaching program for sales managers. And uh, we made our proposal to the director of HR and we got a call back on it, but it was with one of the people that worked for her. And that's not a good sign in the selling process. You want to move up or laterally, but not necessarily down. So uh, I, my partner said, I'm not even going. And he was the master salesperson of the two of us. I learned quite a bit from him. I said, well, I need the practice, so I went down. And I was escorted to this person's office, and he was on the phone. And he, was, he talked for about five minutes. So I had really a good amount of time to scan the, uh, the office. And there was a coaching picture of him with a Little League team. And uh, I've coached about 50 youth sports teams over the years, so I knew we had something to talk about. And you know what? It was related to what we we're trying to sell, a coaching program. So, you know, when he, he stood up from around his desk, came out to greet me, and I said, is that you in the picture? He said, yeah, and I've learned you always ask questions. You don't say, is that your kid? And he goes, that ugly kid? No, that's this one over here. You know, you want to ask, you know, is one of these yours? You know, because he may not have had a kid on the team, for all I knew. And he pointed him out, and we started talking about coaching. And it was a great conversation that ran 20 minutes, building rapport. Mm -hmm. And we only had five minutes more to go in this meeting. And he looked at his watch, he says, Raj, he says, you know, we used up a lot of time already. Um, what, uh, you know, I'm thinking, the best thing I can do is get you a, uh, a, an appointment with the vice president of sales, that's where you should be anyway. Just by building rapport. Don't estimate the importance of that. It, you know, and, but some people, building rapport is, oh, how are you? And that's all they want. You can tell them your dog died and they really don't care. Okay? So you, you want to ask good questions uh, when you get in there, but you need to build some rapport. But if you're dealing with a New Yorker, you want to go very quickly. There are some cultures where you want to go very slowly, okay? I grew up in New York. Building rapport is, you know, not as important as some other areas of the world. Uh, it's kind of a fast, the, the term New York Minute, it's about 15 seconds long. So that's, that's what a New York Minute is. So the next step that you're going to do, you know, you've, you know, you've prepared, you're assessed. Now you ask your open-ended questions. You know, why am I here is a good open-ended question. It's, you know, something that you want to uh, get a feel for. Or, you know, what is the issue that you're dealing with? You know, something open-ended to get them to start to talk about it. And that's still in the assessment stage, part of the building rapport and asking that first open-ended question. But then, when they give you information back, you go into a diagnostic stage, where you start to ask direct questions and drill down into that information. We'll have a model that'll bring this all together and give you the types of questions that you're going to ask. But you move from the situation questions, the open-ended questions, to gap analysis and cause analysis questions, which we'll be talking about as we go through. So you're in a diagnostic stage, but you move back and forth between you drilling down, and when you drill down as far as you think you can go with this, or if they start getting a little nervous, then you back up and ask another open-ended question. But you need a structure for doing this, but they feel like they're leading you because you're following up on the information that they're giving you. And it's, it's a wonderful dance that happens when this works properly, but it's very difficult to learn how to do. Mm -hmm. The best way to do it is with two people. Well, bring a partner in. And I knew my partner, because he was the master salesperson, he would lead the conversation and take us through the stages. But then he'd be maybe 10 minutes into what we had, maybe an hour to be with this person. He'd turn around and say, Raj, I've been kind of hogging the show. Do you have any questions? And I'd have a few questions to follow up on things that maybe he had missed. 
but it's really given him time to think again. And then I say, Ken, you know, back to you, and we start up again. And you learn how to do that back and forth, but when you get out of there, you can also debrief and learn from it. Okay, so having a partner in there is really important. After diagnosis, you want to prescribe, and that doesn't mean the end solution. You really want to summarize what you've learned, and if they correct you, that's important. And you thank them for the correction. You don't get defensive. You say, oh, I, I didn't realize that's what you meant. And then you write it down again. And then you continue your summary. And then you give them a recommendation as to what you think you should do. And usually that recommendation is just more analysis. That if I'm going to write a proposal for you, I need to speak to more of your people. Because I've got your perception of the problem, but maybe your people perceive it differently. But you want to get beyond the manager that you're dealing with to get a true picture of what's going on. Very often, managers have a filtered view of what's going on in their divisions. And so you want to drill down a little bit. Focus group, large organization might be a survey. But you're going to prescribe what you think the next step will be. And after you prescribe, you want to partner. Partnering is interesting because they came to you with a problem. You do not want to take that problem on as your problem. If you're an internal, there's a tendency to do that. They own the problem. <clears throat> there was a great article written years ago by a man by the name of Unkin. It was about monkey management. And uh, in our case, you go in there, their goal as a manager is to take the monkey off of their back and put it on yours. And the article is the care and feeding of monkeys. If the monkey dies, it's your fault. Okay? <laughs> Leave the monkey on their back. They're there to help them. But they have to maintain the monkey. The monkey is in their division. Leave it there. Okay? But you have to partner. And you have to say what you're going to do and what they're going to do, and make sure that you're in agreement. Then you want to reinforce. Most people go through buyer's remorse. Usually in the real estate industry, we talk about buyer's remorse because you have three days in most states to back out of a real estate deal without any penalty. And um, a lot of people will think about, you know, I'm taking every nickel I have in the world, putting it down, and I'm going to owe for 30 years. You know, I have to think about that. Is this really the right house for me? And uh, is the market going up or down? Are the interest rates going up or down? Is this the right time to buy? And you think through all those things, and you know, you may have buyer's remorse. So you want to reinforce their decision to work with you. Maybe by telling the story that's similar to the problem that they have and how it worked out, but something that will reinforce the idea of working with you because they're going to invest time, money, energy in your solutions when you get to that point. Then you've got to follow up. <clears throat> You've got to live up to whatever promises you give these people. In your notes, you'll be able to see this better than what I have up here. But this is the preparation stage. You go in there, and there's certain things you should do as you prepare. And these are in your notes. Don't expect to read them from up here. But it's really research the organization, the division, if you're an internal. Research the problem. Find out about the industry. You want to identify measures of effectiveness for that group, their objectives, and how well they're meeting them. Uh, and you also want to set goals for the meeting. And there are you know, other things that you can do ahead of time. But this is the basic part of what you're doing. But then you want to go in and build rapport, trust, and what we call personal power. You do not have position power. They do not work for you. So you only have to work from a personal power base, which is how they perceive your personality, your confidence, and your integrity. Okay, those are the big three in personal power. So you want to expose them to it. One of the things I did when I first started working with you today was introduce myself and tell you a little bit about my background so that you will feel comfortable that I know what I'm talking about as I put this out to you. It's building my personal power base. I had to do it fairly quickly. You have to do it fairly quickly when you're working with somebody else. So you want to probe gently with the open-ended questions. And really, this is your situation question. You know, why am I here is a great way to start this thing. Or, you know, what is the problem that you're looking at? And get them away from the solution that they're already trying to give you. Those of you in the training business, a lot of people are, you know, the person comes in, somebody with a real nice title comes in, and what they do is they just really want to dump a solution on you saying, I need a two-day course in. Back them away from the solution and try to get to the underlying problem. Okay? If you're in the performance business, training will usually be part of the solution but it's really unimportant compared with creating an environment where those people can succeed. And if the training is really good and the environment doesn't support it, it doesn't matter whether you did the training. I found in sales training that 50% of the training was unnecessary if the sales managers were doing their jobs. Okay? And so we're trying to make up for it with training. That doesn't work very well in most organizations. So you want to actively listen. 
And again, if you want a good book on questioning techniques, like we're talking about open ended and direct, Neil Rackham's book is one of the best ones around on questioning techniques. Now we want to diagnose, and you want to focus the discussion. They will give you a piece of information when they answer the open-ended question, you want to drill down. Sometimes they'll give you two or three, so you want to write them down, and then after you go drill down on the first one, you say, oh, another thing that you mentioned was this, and you drill down in that area. So you go back and forth between what you learned in the open-ended question and where you're drilling down. Right, but you need a structure for doing this, and that's what we're going to take a look at as we go through. But you want to identify the performance gaps and the underlying causes as you're working on this. And again, all you're getting is their perception of the performance gap. And a manager usually can define the performance gap pretty well. This is the present level of performance and this is the desired level of performance. Got to get them to commit to what those things are. Uh, but when it comes to the driving and restraining forces, sometimes they're the restraining force. And they're not going to recognize that right away and you may have to go to their people, find out and bring that news back to them. And that's a hard <coughs> message to deliver, so you've got to learn how to do that as well. And then you move into prescribing and really, again, summarizing and then telling them what the direction you're going to go. And then you're going to partner with them. And again, you don't take the monkey off of their back, you leave it there. But you tell them what you're going to do and make sure they understand that they're part of this solution that we're going to be working on. And you're going to need their support and more than just benign neglect, you're going to want real support from them. When you get, uh, when you're doing the analysis, and when you're implementing the solutions, that's the two points where you're really going to need their support. So you partner with them, and again, you're going to reinforce. You know, you actively listen, make sure you, they understand, and but at the same time, you want to follow up and you clearly define the roles and make sure that we're in agreement, but also kind of resell them on the fact that you're the person to do the job. And of course, you want to follow up. Uh, if you don't follow up well you're probably going to lose the work. So that's the structure, the overall structure for performance consulting. Yes? I have a question about partnering. You're talking about the monkey on someone's back. Right. A lot of times when you go in, it's already on, the monkey's on someone's back, but maybe not the right person. Yeah. And as you move up to try and partner with the right level of person who can actually make things happen, Right. what if they don't have that same, they've already pushed it over here. How do you help them? partner with you and this manager that you're working with yeah. as a senior leader to really own the issue. I just went through this with a major corporation. The question was, how do you move the partnering up to the level that where the problem really lies? But also, you may want to move the problem up to the level where they can do something about it. Uh, it was an instructional system designer that brought me into the organization because she was learning the limitations of the training. She was an ISBI member for years and knew they were broader analysis tools out there, and, uh, but she wasn't going to be the one that was going to get this done. Mm -hmm. And the way we captured her boss, who was the uh, vice, senior vice president for global training and development for this organization, uh, was we ran a course and she made sure he took the course. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it started to dawn on him as we're going through there, and I would talk with him at the breaks and have dinner with him and ask him about the problems he was facing. and talked about it, and one of the things that he did, because the course was on analysis for a day and a half and then half a day on evaluation, he went to the trainers who were running a uh, oh, kind of a happiness pool because all they were evaluated on was the level one evaluations. <laughs> now he learned there was a level two, a level three, a level four, possibly a level five, and so uh, he went in there and said to his trainers, the platform trainers, he said, what would happen if we started doing level three evaluations? And to a person, they were honest, so it would completely change the way they trained their people. And so he started to learn that he, he was part of the problem because he was stroking them for the smile sheets when really he should be looking at them for something else. Uh, there's an article I have, Evaluation, the Link Between Learning and Performance. It's on my website, you can download it again for free. But uh, in there, the example from Century 21 Real Estate, which I cleared with their lawyers, that's why I can mention it. Uh, I was a vice president and made sure that we could publicly disclose this information. But what we found was that one of the trainers who was in the bottom third, actually almost the bottom of the line of 100 trainers around the country on the smile sheets, his graduates, when we did level four evaluation of the graduates, were the highest in the country. And so rather than firing him, which someone recommended to me as I was coming in the door as a vice president, we had him train the other ones on what he was doing. 
Okay, so but you got to push it up, and sometimes it's to move the problem up to the right level. But in another case, you got to find a champion that's going to have the power to make this thing happen too. But great question, good. So that's the model, and a lot of times you go through all seven steps, but sometimes you have some shortcuts. Um, you can go in, do just ask the open-ended question to realize you don't have a solution for this thing, that it's really outside of what you do. And uh, you might work around it a little bit, but then you're going to have to say, look, uh, I am not the right person. If you do know the right person, you might turn them on to that. I had this situation, actually I got as far as the diagnostic stage, with a company from uh, uh, Chicago, and I wanted to back them up to do, doing a strategic plan. Somebody mentioned that earlier, that strategic plan has got to cascade down. So it's a key element of what we do in performance. And so I uh, you know, started talking to them about a strategic plan. They said, well, we already tried that. We're not going to do it again. And at that point, I wasn't going to work with them. But I did send them a proposal uh, in terms of what they should be looking for in their proposals. Uh, and I reinforced the idea that if you don't do the strategic plan, I'm available a year from now when you find out your solutions aren't working. And I do that with all of the jobs that I'm turning down because invariably I do get callbacks a year later uh, to at least find out what they should be doing to try and make it work. It's a lot of times when they choose a training solution without looking at the environment. Uh, but it's, I, I tell them also it's going to be harder once you implement the training and it doesn't work to change the environment to match it. So, it uh, becomes a more complex problem at that point, but then they have to pay a little bit more for it. And, all right, but uh, so you can move from uh, assessment to reinforcement and go out the door. You can go from diagnosis to reinforcement, but you can also go from, from diagnosis to partnering. And by that I mean um, if you've done work with them before, the case study we're going to work on today is a real case study that I worked through, and the gentleman who brought me in eventually moved to another company, called me up, and he said, Raj, can you do the same magic in this group as you did in the other group? I said, well, again, I'm going to have to do a little assessment before we implement the same solutions because I don't know whether it's going to match. But basically, I didn't have to take him through the prescription because he already knew what the prescription looked like and was calling me in because he knew it would work. So there are times when you have some jump-off points in this, too. Any of you familiar with situational leadership? Okay. Walking across the top, it's a style four to a style three to a style two, prescribed to style one, partnering to style two, reinforcement to style three, and style four as you follow up. It's really just working back and forth. And uh, there's an article that I wrote with Paul Hersey. He and Ken Blanchard developed situational leadership. I studied under them for five years. Uh, bottom line is that that article is on the website. It's about coaching, but it's really the same type of guide and you'd be able to transfer the information fairly easily as to how situational leadership fits into this model. The questioning techniques we use, you know, we ask the situation questions during the assessment stage and we use the performance gap and the cause analysis questions in the diagnosis. The problem that I ran into, I was doing uh, a presentation at the ASTD conference, I happened to be in Washington, D.C. that year, and uh, there were about 300 people in the room. That's why I like doing the IASBI conferences. Try and do an interactive role play with 300 people. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah. bad enough with 60 people, but I mean, when you get to really large numbers, you, you lose a lot of people. But uh, I use Neil Rackham's spin selling, the spin model, situation questions, the problem questions where you identify the problem, then the implications of those problems, then the need value, which really should just be value, but then it would spell stiff. And so he wanted to spin, so it's need value. But the bottom line was, I used that. But I wasn't getting paid for it. I told them where it came from, told them where they could get the books, basically. And, uh, but there was a licensed spin selling instructor in the room who reported me to the company that owned the rights now. Neil Rackham had sold the rights. And I get this five page cease and desist letter from the lawyers. And I wrote back, I don't think you understand. They didn't do assessment before they made their intervention, by the way. Wow. So I wrote back to them. I said, I don't think you understand the circumstances under which I was using it. Sent them my handout. Told them what the situation was and how I documented everything in the handout. And then I wrote back and said, oh, okay, you can use it that way. And I wrote back and said, I'll never touch that sucker again. <laughs> but I do recommend the book. So. But anyway, wow. you want to ask these type of questions as you're going through. <laughs> But, you know, you never want to uh, make an intervention without doing some analysis. And that comes from situational leadership and also comes from performance improvement. 
And where we start the analysis is defining where we are. And I've worked with organizations where they know they're feeling pain, but they don't have any measurements of where they are. One company that I've mentioned already, they had a problem with retention. I said, how do you measure retention? We don't. We just feel pain, okay? Nobody thought to measure what the average length of time they were on board they were, what groups were losing at a rapid rate. They had no information on that. So the first thing we had to do was to find where they were, okay? A lot of times companies know where they are. Uh, they've got a very exacting level that they're working from. And then we want to take a look at where we want to be. For strategic plan, this could be five or ten years out. You can work on gaps that large. For an operational setting, it's usually six months, could be a year. But if it's a year, this type of thing isn't going to motivate anybody because most people, their idea of long-term planning is what's for lunch. I mean, they don't see out that far. Uh, work with a sales organization and see what I mean. It's it, very quick timelines in terms of uh, how far they see out. So we can define the performance gap, and that really is the difference between where we are and where we want to be. And managers do that every day. They go into their offices, they look at the present level of performance, look at the desired level of performance, and they see a performance gap. They may not call it, call it a performance gap, mm -hmm. but the problem is they go from that performance gap, which is the problem, right to solutions. They think about how they handled it in the past, or they might call somebody else and describe it and say, how did you handle it? But that's the problem. They don't do a good cause analysis. And that's why I wanted to bring these type of ideas to line managers. The next step is to set a reasonable goal. And I, I'm probably the only one who does this in gap analysis. But when you, you have, like, say, this is where we are in a year, we want to be here. That motivates nobody. What you want to do is set a reasonable goal, but in three months, this is where we want to be. In other words, in, in a, we used to call management by objectives, that was really popular. This is a milestone. It's an intermediate step, and it allows people to see themselves doing that. And uh, there's some great examples of how this works. Uh, but then after you identify the present level of performance and the desired level of performance, you want to take a look at the things working for you, they're driving forces, they're different strengths, that's why the length of the lines are different. And then there are restraining forces, things working against us. Maybe you have a great training program, that might be that big plus four over there, but maybe the big minus four over there is that the environment doesn't support the training. Okay, so you know that you're going to have some problems with uh, the actual acceptance of the training and its implementation on the job. Okay. Uh, let's see, how do I get there? What we're going to talk about is the difference between the work environment, characteristics of the work environment, and the individual. This comes from uh, Thomas Gilbert's book on human confidence and his behavioral engineering model. But basically, the studies that have been done show that about 15% of performance issues on the job are related to the individual and 85% are due to the environment that they're working in. Now, we're replicating these studies. I do a lot of work with the nuclear industry, and they've been doing replications of the study, actually just breaking down information that they already have to see where this lies, and they're getting numbers like 25% uh, and 75%. But it's still the lion's share of the performance issues are in the upper part, in the environment. So that's why if you implement a training Solution, what area does that cover? Which of the cells? Knowledge. Oh. Oh. Little laser doesn't work. The knowledge box. Mm -hmm. But you're dealing with part of the bottom 15%. And if the people haven't cho been chosen right for capacity, meaning their ability to do the job and their ability to learn, and if they haven't been chosen right for their motives, your 15% is going to die just in the individual level. Right. Right? And if you pick the wrong people, you can train them forever, and you're not going to get what you want coming out. A good example of this was a story I learned years ago about a trainer who's walking through Nordstrom's with a Nordstrom's trainer, and, you know, just asking questions about how they train their people. And one question that came up was, how do you train your people to be so polite? And the answer was, we don't. We hire people whose parents taught them to be polite. Nice. <laughs> Politeness was nice. a selection issue. So you select for the things you can't train. When I had my training center out on the west coast for uh, the Coast Guard, 
I had 140 instructors, I had seven schools, and those school chiefs would pick the instructors. But I wanted to give them guidelines. And I looked at our, the biggest Coast Guard training center was in Yorktown, Virginia, and I looked at what they used for selection, seven pages of you know, what to do, just like these people. I came out with three factors I wanted. One was recent experience, because you can't teach recent experience. They either come with that. So if it was a radio man, I wanted him to come from a ship, or I wanted him to come from a communication station, but I wanted him to come from someplace where they're practicing what they're going to teach. Then I wanted interpersonal skills. If they don't have interpersonal skills, they can't counsel the students, but also if they have interpersonal skills, we can teach them platform skills. If they don't have interpersonal skills, it's very hard to teach the platform skills. And the last one was that they genuinely cared about people. Because they didn't care about people, they're not going to care about these students. I remember when I was teaching at the Coast Guard Academy, I actually heard one officer say, this would be a great place if it wasn't for all the damn cadets. <laughs> well, the only reason why we were there was those damn cadets. And so, uh, actually, I had a, a, a meeting with my, uh, my whole staff in a base theater, about 140 people. And one of the chief petty officers raised his hand and I said, yes, chief. He said, if I understand you right, the students are now the most important people on this base. I said, let's make no mistake. They're the only reason why we're here. So let's not lose track of that. And I said, another thing, let me change the order because it was the platform instructors who were the most important up to that point. I said, the next most important are the designers. And they kind of looked at me, why is that? I said, well, because when they make a change, it influences all of the platform instructors, all right? A platform instructor has 24 people, but the course designer has everybody who goes through there, and everybody subsequently will go through there. Even if you refine the course further, they're building on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. So we had to redefine these types of roles in terms of what was really the high priority. But you've got to select those three factors, great factors to select for. And you select for those things, and then you train them in the areas that they need to be trained. But if they didn't have those three factors, training wasn't going to be the solution. But then you got to look at the work environment. With Century 21, I had a big problem. I was, uh, I think, in this room for Lowe's yesterday. And Lowe's was talking about their interventions and really powerful story that they have. Um, but I went up and uh, asked Don Kirkie, who I've known for years, I said, Don, uh, how do you deal with the different environments? You know, because you've got so many stores. And he said, well, they're pretty well standardized. And you know, I accepted that, but on the same hand, we all know the different managers will create different environments. But in my case, Century 21 had 5,000 different office environments. And we prided ourselves that every office is independently owned and operated. And you couldn't standardize them because then the parent company was liable for any mistakes made by these individual offices. So 5,000 different offices, how do you work on the work on the environment. And training was the drug of choice of Century 21. I mean, that's what they went to first. And so what I did was, I wouldn't allow the brokers to send their people to the new course that we had out to train their new salespeople, 20,000 new salespeople a year coming in. They couldn't sell their, send their new people until they took a one-day course, it had leadership in it, it had goal setting in it, so that they would sit down with their people before they sent them to the training and knew what to reinforce when they came back from the training. So we use the training solution to affect the environment so that the students would have a higher probability of success when they went back. Okay? That's how you build one off of the other. Okay. The information cell, you know, is a powerful cell. If you're only going to make one change, this is the area to make the change. It's in clear expectations about roles, about goals. It's the proper use of feedback. When the Gallup organization did a survey over millions of people, they have 12 factors that they work towards in improving the work environment. And they ask these people, in which one of these areas would you improve the most if it were to change, and you know, change in the right direction? And uh, the bottom line was clear expectations about their jobs, and the second one that stood out was feedback. And they were on a bar graph in USA Today, and I wish I had saved this, you know, and blown it up. But the, the two for... Uh, you know, the uh, clear expectations and the feedback were out over here at this size, and the other ones were all half that size and smaller. So your best bang for the buck is working on those expectations. Unfortunately, in most organizations, they use training to define the expectations, rather than having the supervisor do it. Because the information cell is really control controlled by the supervisor and the managers above them. 
for her. Resources, time, equipment, material, uh, incentives, what we measure. And I've always said what gets measured gets done. Uh, there was a wonderful line that they usually attribute to Deming, but I actually, I always check my quotes. I contacted the Deming Institute and they said he didn't really say that, although they always attribute it to him. It came out of the quality movement and it said, uh, in God we trust, all others bring data. And, uh, you know, you want to measure things is what it boils down to. But what you measure will automatically start to change things. You know, using evaluation will actually encourage your graduates to perform at a higher level when they leave your courses. And yet most organizations don't do level three or level four evaluations. Painfully few. So you've got a blown up version of what I've just talked about. And what I did was I took uh, the basic model, and if, you, if any of you uh, sit in on the Harless discussion yesterday, uh, one did, uh, two did, a couple did. All right, yeah, Guy was filming at that point. <laughs> and we can edit that line out, by the way, Guy. Uh, but the bottom line was, uh, in there, they were talking about uh, use of simple words, which you'll find that I've simplified the vocabulary of this. But they also talked about how so many uh, of the modern, quote, techniques go right back to uh, Gilbert and uh, don't give him the credit that he deserves. And uh, when I wrote my article in 2003, Tom Gilbert was dead for over five years. If you're going to rewrite the work of a guru, make sure they're dead five years. <laughs> right? Because I thought I was clear at that point. I put the article out and I get an email from Marilyn Gilbert, his wife. And Marilyn had helped him work on the book and what have you. And she was very pleased with the article. She said, first of all, you gave full credit to Tom and printed his model. And then she talked to me about the probe questions and how to use those. And actually, she only had hard copies of it, so she had to fax it to me. And then I developed probe questions in another article based <coughs> on that. But uh, make sure they're dead five years. If you rewrite my work, wait a while, OK? <laughs> I only look healthy, but uh, yeah. still got to wait. Okay. From there, we built a, uh, or I built a one-page job aid, which is the next page in your notes. It'll be on three slides because if I put it up here as one slide, you wouldn't be able to see it. Um, but the initial part is what we've already talked about. It's the present level of performance, a desired level of performance, and setting the reasonable goal. So it's the opportunity to write those things down because that's really what you're going to determine the driving forces and the restraining forces. See. When you define those driving and restraining forces, it's how it impacts the performance gap. Not how it just exists out in nature. It's how it impacts it. Is it helping you close the gap or is it working against you? Okay, so you want to define your performance gap first, set your reasonable goal, and then start to look at the driving and restraining forces. In other words, the information cell. Are there clear expectations? If it's a driving force and it's very important, it might be out of plus three or plus four. And usually we draw an arrow, my laser's working here, but uh, you know, an arrow in from the plus four into the, uh, the zero point and say that's a very large driving force. <coughs> and a lot of organizations, clear expectations or confused expectations or whatever you want to call it, they're restraining forces. Might be out to minus three or minus four, okay? And this is a way of first of all identifying the causes and then uh, graphically showing them and weighting them all at the same time. All right, so it's kind of neat from that point of view. And these terms come right out of those six cells that we just looked at from the updated version of Gilbert's uh, behavioral engineering model. Yes? Can you give me an example of time resources and how you use that? I mean, it seems everybody is stretched for time. You know, right. He's got time for anything. So yep. how would you just use a particular item in this model as opposed yeah. to I'll give you an example. When I went out to the Coast Guard Training Center uh, in 1983, all of the curriculums were written in knowledge-based outcomes. And actually, a radioman didn't demonstrate what they had to do. They had to answer a multiple-choice test. Think about that. I mean, there's no multiple-choice test when he's on watch someplace. He's got to be able to do whatever we trained him in. Uh, there were two that were more behaviorally based. The EMT school, because they had to be certified, and they had to be able to do the chest, chest compressions and had to do tourniquets and had to do everything. So they were demonstrating what they had to do. And the cook school. Because the cook school, obviously, people had to eat their product. And they, they ran the gallery. So 
you know, there was great feedback and it was very observable, the output. But all the other schools were really knowledge-based. And uh, so we wanted to make that transition. Everybody was already working 50 hours a week. So we needed time. And so what I needed to first do was eliminate some of the roles that they were doing. And there were reports that had no value. There were all kinds of things that as the manager of this division, I could say, I no longer need those. And it cut down on the amount of time I had to spend on some issues. And then freed up that time so that we could do the other things. When I went to Century 21, I asked them, I was, you know, I had been a consultant, but I was on the outside, now I was inside. And I asked my immediate staff of seven people, you know, have you ever done a, a goal setting process where you made A category and B category and C category? And they said, yeah, we did that about six months ago. And I said, can you bring it in? They had like 14 A's. When we left that meeting, they had three. Because most people can only focus on three things at a time. And I basically eliminated those other things. That gave them the time to focus on the three. So that'd be two examples of how you use time. But good question. Time is one of the toughest ones to work with. But if you're the manager, that's why you want to work with the manager. We're going to have to free up some time so that they're able to do this. And they own that part of the problem. You don't, as the consultant or as the trainer. Great question. But you can see where these things come out of the, the six cells. And what you want to be able to do is construct this after you do the interview with the manager. So as you're asking the open-ended questions, you can start off with the information cell. And uh, you know, after you've gone through the dance and maybe you start to talk about these people a little bit, you might go back and say, how do you people know what to do? And that's around clear expectations. And so if he says that, oh, there's a manual that they can read and that will tell them, and that's all there is, you know there's a problem in expectations because nobody reads the damn manual anyway. And if they do read the manual, they go into their job and they say, how do we do it here? Right? And they team up with somebody and they learn how they do it there. So the bottom line is you can ask questions in each of these different areas. And I've got the probe questions. They're in the third edition of the uh, handbook. Can I give them to you in your notes? I don't have a copy of your notes. Are, are there two pages of questions in your notes? No. Okay, well, you're going to have to dig them out of uh, the uh, third edition of the handbook. There's a question in the back. And you, and you said this already, I missed it. Are you filling this out in cooperation with that manager, or are you having that manager put his or her own assessment of where yeah. those factors lie? Great question. You can do this with a single manager and right in front of them and show them it or what have you. Or you can just have it as your notes, think about it, and then construct it and then show it to the manager. But even better, you can do the manager with two supervisors and four workers. You know, like a stratified random sample type of thing. And, uh, and have them do it and wait it. Uh, usually you have the manager define the performance gap because they know where they want to go. They, can, they usually have measures of the present level of performance. That's usually not negotiable. But the causes are. And if they have good open communications, you can use a focus group to do it. You can do it on your own, you can do it with the manager, you can do it with the group. And it's a you know, great tool because if you do it with a group, you can throw it up on a big sheet of paper and you know, start to talk this thing through. And, but you know, invariably, we'll go back and re-rate them, and, uh, but it'll give you a good picture. And it's not important that it's a three or a four. It's important that it's a driving force or a restraining force. But if it's a four, you know it's a major factor you're going to have to deal with. Great question, though. So you can use it in a number of different ways. Okay, you've got a case study in your notes. I want you to read these, I guess it's four paragraphs. And we're going to have this interactive role play in a couple of seconds because what you're going to do after you read that is you're going to come up with uh, a, uh, a quick definition of the present level of performance in just, just uh, you know, descriptive terms. Uh, the present level of performance and the desire level of performance. Tell me about this team. And then when you get down to the reasonable goal, there is a measurable reasonable goal that you can come up with. So take a couple of minutes, read it, and then uh, after I give you time to do that, I want you to work on present level of performance, desire level of performance, and then <coughs> descriptive terms. What do you know about this team? And then the, uh, the reasonable goal that you're going to set. So now you're on your own for a couple of minutes.
Does everyone have a handout? There are a few extras up here. Thank you. It's a still picture. I know, that's why, that's why I'm laughing. <laughs> I only look drunk. give you space just for where they are or where they want to be. Just kind of short circuiting this exercise because we only have the 90 minutes. So just go fill in those two blanks. And if you get ahead, what we're looking for is you come up with some open-ended questions, which is down at the bottom. You're going to use those to interview them. And uh, again, it's a little risk. People who want to be involved will be involved and people who don't can watch and learn from that. Don't turn the page and look at the answers. <coughs> and just descriptive terms as to where that team is and where you'd like them to be in a short period of time that you've got, three months. where you have to do a little bit of work. But the feedback I get from almost all the different groups I work with is the questioning is, was one of the most valuable things that they've gotten. So this we're all told the value of questions, but nobody's ever really touched on it. Okay, everyone's at least read the uh, case. What would you say a couple of descriptive terms about this group? Anyone? How would you describe this group, this team? Yes? They have diverse experience levels. Right, yeah. Really interesting because some have knowledge of sales, some have knowledge of the product, 
but no one's complete, but very diverse group. What else? Yes? Collectively, their average and their skills in the products that sell them. I'm sorry, collectively? They're average. They're like right in the middle of a high low. Uh, yeah, some of them are really good at the product knowledge and some of them are really good at the sales. Um, but I guess if you average it out, yeah, you know, because they're missing the other component. So there'd be somewhere in between in terms of rating them at this point. But uh, there are two that helped build the product, know it cold, and there were two that were really good at sales. So, you know, I don't know that I would call them average. They're, like this gentleman was saying, they're very diverse. What else would you say about them? Also, the manager that you had was not an experienced salesperson. Right, and you know, you gotta be careful how you address that. Yes. Someone in a role play or the skill practice said, and what do you bring to this equation? <laughs> and you know, that's a delicate issue, but it's a good observation. What else? There's you, one that's key that you're missing. I, I know this company. <laughs> I've worked for this company, and there's a serious talent management issue here yeah. at the leadership level. Yeah. They don't know how to hire, and they're, uh, so yeah, that's, among other things, I'm saying. Yeah. Well, you're going to find out why the sales manager is in the job if you do the interview right. Somebody else? Yes. I was going to say that the, it's not clear what they're hiring for. Yeah. Uh, the, the sales manager has neither strong product experience and knowledge nor sales experience. Yeah, again, you're going to find out why he's there. And there's a real logical reason why he's there even though that's the problem, yes? There's an expressed gap between the sales team and the customer service team. Yeah, okay, there's Whatever a gap going on there that we may have to deal with. The most important one we haven't covered yet, yes? Metrics. Measurement. Measurement. It sounds like the measurement system is lacking. All right, yeah, the measurement system is lacking. There's one measure that they certainly have, though. They're entering a new market, which brings about a different set of skills that kind of required. Okay, let me tell you, that's true. Let me tell you the most important thing, they're not productive. They're not selling anything. Right. The one sale that was made was made by the CEO. So I mean, you know, look at what's important. What should they be doing? Selling. Okay? That's the goal. <clears throat> All the other things contribute to that, but at the same time, they're unproductive, and you've got to address that issue. What would they look like if they were truly a, you know, a good seller? <coughs> How would it change? Well, they would be selling. <laughs> right? That, that, that would be a nice change. But also they'd probably be cross-trained. The salespeople would learn the product better, the product people would learn selling better. And so we'd see this mixture between the two. And actually the reasonable goal would be something along the lines of, you know, first of all, they're unproductive, mixed readiness levels, inexperienced sales manager, in danger of floundering. And this was just come out of one class. Uh, desired level performance, a trained, confident, productive, and continuously improving sales team. And then the reasonable goal, one sale per salesperson per month in three months. And that's what we're going for. Okay? Now, what I want you to do, just take a few more minutes. Some of you have been working on it. A couple of open-ended questions about things that you're concerned about. Number you're concerned about the manager. But focus on the sales team as well, because we want to know some things about the sales team. And think back, the ultimate goal is to be able to fill out that cause analysis worksheet. You know, we filled out the top part. Are there clear expectations? Is there proper feedback? Do they have the proper resources? All those type of things we've got to know when we get through this. You're going to have 20 minutes or so to be able to do this. So, any, uh, take a couple minutes, come up with a couple, open any questions, and then we'll start this interactivity. I actually learned this technique at an ISPI conference about 20 years ago. <laughs> Only it was completely unstructured, and I decided to write the case study rather than just read it to you and, uh, and do a gap analysis before we did the role play, that type of stuff. But the idea of an interactive role play in a group, I never saw it done before. Very low risk strategy for everybody. Roger, who are you picturing in the room that these questions can be addressed to? Me. I'm the sales manager. Just that one and person? Just me. That's all you're talking with. This is what the notes that you have, those four paragraphs, are what I learned on the phone when I talked with them. That was on a Friday. I was meeting with them on a Monday. Okay, in the meantime, I've done some homework and looked up the company and did other things. But uh, now I'm going to come through the door. We've already built a little rapport. 
Uh, I was told by the marketing director who I befriended just outside. I got there 10 minutes early, started to talk with him, and he said, how much time did they give you for your interview? I said, 30 minutes. He says, if you're out of there in 31, you've already lost a job. Very close time tolerances on this guy. So we're going to have some close time tolerances as well. Uh, we're not going to have as much time as you really need, but you'll get the idea of what we're doing. So take another minute or so, track them up with at least one, open-ended question. And the way we'll do this is that someone will ask the open-ended question. They have the first right to drill down after I give a response. In other words, I'm going to answer the question with some information that you should be drilling down into. But if they draw a blank or, you know, just not ready to do it at that point, I'll ask for a direct question. Don't give me an open-ended question again because you will have just insulted me because I gave you information and you're not talking to me about it. Okay? So, take another couple seconds, come up with an open-ended question. I'm sure out of the group we'll have some good ones. This will go for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have five minutes at the end while you see the, uh, the output of it. And if you want the more advanced consulting version of the job aid that we just looked at, go on my website. There's two articles. Download all six. Take a look at them, but you'll find the uh, job aids. And if you want the Word version of either this one or the more advanced one, just drop me an email, and I will send it to you. People are surprised. It just comes back just saying, as long as you leave the copyright on it, you're welcome to use it any way you want. The only thing that most people in ISBI care about is if you try to sell their stuff. And it's been done. <laughs> We're nice people, but we can be provoked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who would like to fire it up with any questions? All right, let's I start uh, what do your best salespeople do? What are some of the behaviors of your best salespeople? Uh, well, that's been kind of hard to tell. Um, we, we do have the two with the sales experience, and right now we're sending them out with the, the product knowledge people, so we'll send them out in pairs. And uh, that combination works pretty well. The salesperson takes the lead and brings in the expert expertise when he needs it. And so it's really hard to assess the best one. Got a drill down question? How would you say that they, is there, a, do you think, well, how, how would you say they transfer their knowledge between each other? Like, how does that happen in their work together? Okay, it happens, starts here. Uh, we run sessions where we try to cross train and you know, I facilitate those. And then before they go out on the job, we discuss the company, I make sure that they're prepared and that they know about the different companies that they're going to see. They usually, on their first visit, they'll see six companies at one time. We're dealing with mid-sized companies. The large mortgage companies, like Fannie Mae and what have you, already use our software. They get together six to eight small mid-sized companies because they want them on the same software product. So they can exchange information electronically. And because uh, they buy their mortgages, basically. So we, uh, we go in there, we talk about the six or eight people that they're going to meet, we talk about the strategy. We used to think we could close on a sale in that meeting, but we found out that there are really three decision makers, and at best we have one of them in the room. So what we try to do is close on a meeting in their office. So your staff are marked on their ability to close sales? Well, actually, they're, right now they're marked on how well they can close that meeting and get the meeting back in their office. So those are good follow-up direct questions. But I gave some other information out. Somebody else, a direct question on any information I gave. Yes? Where can I or your staff find product knowledge information? Okay, um, you know, some of it's on our website, which I assumed you already looked at. Um, but uh, some of it is, uh, you know, I can line you up where you can meet with the customer service people. That's where that resides, that information. But that really didn't ask a question. I dropped a couple of good pieces of information on it. Yes? Um, with regard to the large mortgage companies, Fannie Mae and so forth, have they provided uh, feedback to, to, uh, to you about the value of the software? Uh, yeah, they, uh, they were part of our market analysis uh, because really what we're selling uh, these companies 
is a version that has to interface with their version. And, you know, I wouldn't call it dumbed down, but it meets their needs better in the office. But the product that comes out can be transferred electronically and go right into the larger organizations. So they were very happy with the software. And they, you know, they, they organize these things as a lunch and invite the people in. And these people invariably will send one representative because this is an organization that buys their mortgages. So they need to have a good relationship. So that was a good question because you framed it first and then you asked a direct question to follow it up. Yes? So you, you talked about earlier about um, how your sales team is transferring that knowledge among each other. But one of the things that you talked about initially uh, when you reached out to me was that you're looking for training to enhance the selling skills. So is there something that specifically concerns you about how they're transferring that knowledge? Yeah, it's taking too long. But again, that was a good way of framing it to get to the question that you wanted to ask, and that, that was good. And, but the answer is, um, they are growing, they are learning, but it's taking too long. And sometimes we're training people on things they already know. And, you know, it's, it's just not an efficient system, and that's why we're asking, you know, groups like you to come in and give us a recommendation. But good job on the question. Yes? When you were hired by the CEO, what expectations did he have for you in, in terms of uh, sales performance from your area? Well, remember when I told you that we had one sale and that was done by the CEO? That was to my organization. Ah. I was a partner in that organization. I looked at this product and liked it so much, I talked with them and I said, I'd like to buy in. It cost me all the money that I got out of selling out of my partnership to my partners. And I bought into the company because I really believe in this product and I think it's going to do wonders for mid-sized companies. So that's how I got here. And so I have limitations, I recognize them, but at the same time I really do believe in the product and with your help or somebody's help, we should be able to bring it to market better. you have a follow-up question? Did he establish a specific set of goals for you that he wanted to achieve or specific set of companies that he was hoping that you'd be able to bring in? Um, really, the, the, most, the best direction I have is what I told you, one sale per salesperson per month. And when he started this, it was about six months to go, but now we have just about three months to go. And they haven't made a sale yet. So, see, we're still in discovery. We're it's trial and error to discover what their selling process really is. That's, I have a follow-up question for the first yeah. conversation. You, in your discussion, um, so when you were speaking, you mentioned that it takes time to get the sale to follow. Yeah. And in that discussion, you had mentioned that only one of the three decision makers are in the room. Right. Can you tell me more about that? Why are we not able to get the decision makers together? Well, you know, somebody's got to run their business while they're away. And uh, they're, they're, they're mid-sized companies, but there's really three decision makers the owner, who might have a title of president or CEO, whatever they like. Um, there's a financial type that has to make sure that this really does work financially for them. And then there's usually an IT director. And those two are usually buried in the company someplace. And it's usually the CEO that shows up, but he's not going to make that decision without the input of the other two. So we're getting the senior person in. Uh, but the senior person is motivated differently than the other two because they own the company. It's a decision of, do I spend $100,000 on the software and $5,000 a month on service after it? Or do I buy a new Mercedes? I mean, that, that's the type of decisions that they're making because they own the company. It's not like dealing with the major companies where it's just a question of how we want to spend our money because it's not their money. It's a little more personal. Somebody got a follow-up question? Or? So do you believe then that maybe you're not seeing the benefits? Well, good question. The problem with the benefits is, right now, my old company is running two sets of books to see how this works. That information will be audited in two weeks. Until it's audited, we cannot really use it in the selling process because they won't believe it. I've been tracking it from a distance. It's showing everything positive that we thought was going to happen. I'm sure the audits are going to come out, but we're not going to have that audited information for two weeks. So we have some companies that are just waiting to see that on the information to establish the benefits and the value to the organization. Good question. Yes, over here. Um, going back to kind of where you come from, um, 
as a, as a sales manager, have you um, built a, a, any sort of process or anything that will leverage your connections into the industry with your sales folks? Yeah, well, there were other companies in our area, but they were competitors. Mm -hmm. And so I would meet, I met some people at conferences and things like that, but none that I really became close with. So. Um, it would have been nice if I had some, you know, hot leads that I could talk to the person and then send the salespeople in, but really, it doesn't exist. Good question. Yes? So as a follow-up to that, um, Good. so you mentioned, you mentioned that, um, have you considered doing like a sales SWOT analysis where you're looking at strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats to the product so that when your salespeople go in, they can speak to each of those areas, would that be an area that, that would help them? Okay, what you're doing is giving me a solution right now. And what we want to do is be tapping in this guy for all the information we can get. It's, it's a good idea, but that's one of the tendencies is to start moving towards solutions when you're still in the assessment stage. Good. And I'll follow up. You just mentioned that you didn't have a lot of information from the lead that you're bringing with you in the field from what you just said. You met some people at conferences. Oh, yeah, when I was working in my old job, yes. But I thought you said, also said earlier that the training you give your sales group before they go out to make a sale is you're the one providing the information about the customer. Well, are no. How are you gathering the information? There are manuals that the government puts out that gives a profile of every one of these companies. And they can go to them and they see the number of sales, mortgages that they've made, the dollar value of them, and a lot of other information. And they have a profile sheet that they have to develop from that. And I don't give them the information. I make sure that they have gathered that information and that they've really researched that company. That geographic area that they're going into might be different. And uh, there are some contacts in the larger organizations that we can tap into that they have to do. Uh, but I, I'm not the provider. I'm the insurer that that takes place. Good question, though, to make sure you got clarity on the issue. All the way in the back. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, how would you describe your team's capacity for collaboration and implementing new change, if you know at this point, and if we did have the perfect solution, what kinds of concerns do you anticipate as far as implementation? Okay, that was a good way, you know, you actually said shifting gears to ask another open-ended question, okay? And good. Um, I don't think there's going to be any resistance to change. These people are all very dedicated. The ones who develop it want to see it succeed. The salespeople, this is their life. Um, the fourth or the fifth one knows a little bit about the product, knows a little bit about sales, and I think he'll adapt well. The sixth one I'm concerned about is the brother-in-law of the CEO, and somehow he got plugged in here, even though the only thing he sold was real estate and didn't do a good job with that. Now you know a little bit more about the stack. Yes, Richard? Yeah, I'd like to return uh, back to your experience of getting into the, the company. Yeah, you seem very interested in my background. <laughs> you, well, what I'd like to know is uh, how did the CEO target your company and how did he excite you I, to make you want to come with the company? Yeah, he lives in a gated community with one of my partners. And uh, so he knew him and uh, told them about where they were going and my partner said, why don't you come in? And uh, we agreed to do it for basically half price that we would pay at the end because we would be the ones that would be the beta site. So uh, that's, that's how it took place. All the way back. Well, my question is in regards, you talked about initially that this sales team was formed to bring the product to market. And you shared with us that uh, you're very excited and you believe in this product. Yes. Can you tell me what has been done to tap into the expertise? You have a team uh, that has a diverse background. Have you been able to clearly articulate your expectations and get their input as to what they feel it would take to get you to your goal? A good question. Until we can define the selling process, it's very hard to communicate clear expectations beyond where we know that process has gone. We know now that when we go into those groups, that the best we're going to be able to do is close on getting into their offices and meeting with the three or four decision makers that we need to meet with. Um, we're beginning to go into those offices and do that. And what we discovered there was that there are different needs from those different people. It should have been more obvious, but the financial person asks different questions than the IT person. 
And so we're building job aids so that they can answer those questions more easily. Um, but we're, it's hard to give a real clear cut of expectations until we get the process clearly defined. That's a good question. Yeah. Let me look at my watch here. We'll take a couple more. Yes? Yes. Uh, when you are going to, to sell one, uh, one, uh, one product, uh, your team, what's the, uh, is there incentive or reward? Oh, yeah. Well, good question because we're getting the compensation which deals with the motives. One of the things you haven't done is really worked from the six cells. Great questions, they're all over the map, but this one brings us back to one of the cells, which is super. Um, because motives, compensation, rewards, covers a number of different things. They get a base salary that's not enough to live in this area. They also get benefits, medical and dental and optical and what have you. Um, but right now, in order for them to survive, <coughs> They're taking advances against future sales. And in about three months, it's going to make more sense for them to leave than it is to try and make this up. And that's part of the reason why you only have a three-month window. Um, the other part of it is that the boss only gave us so much time. But it's a compensation system where they get 25% of the sale. So each sale, they make $25,000 on. In other words, if they were selling six of these products a year, uh, they'd be making good money. I have a follow-up question. And the fact that you're working in a team, does it affect the system? Well, the fact that they're working in a team, I, I talked about the compensation, and they said they would just split it 50-50. And so it doesn't seem to be an issue for them. You know, we kind of work on those things together, and that's not the issue. Okay, we're going to cut this off at this point. You see how the questioning takes place? But do you also see how difficult this is? Yeah. You've got to be listening and understanding and developing another question at the same time. And it's like when you're a brand new instructor. When I had a leadership school years and years ago, uh, I was asked by the Coast Guard to form the school. And so there were five enlisted men who had never taught this material before and didn't know anything about it before. Situational leadership, group dynamics, team building. You know, they were good people, but no knowledge is there, basically high school graduates. And they're going to be teaching stuff that's taught at the undergraduate and graduate level in universities. So I had to train them in that. But at the same time, when they went in to teach, I would sit in the back of the room as the content expert, but also would watch them teach. But what we found was when they're teaching an enlisted class, they would throw the class off because there was an officer in the class with them. And so they wouldn't ask questions as much. So we put a camera in the back of the room, and I would sit in a conference room behind. We would tell them that was going on. We'd have another instructor in the back of the room, and they didn't seem to care. Because I couldn't look at them. All I could look at was the instructor, because it was focused on the instructor. And that took the pressure off of the class. But in order to develop, feedback is the breakfast of champions. You need two of you to go in there, both understanding the process you're going to take them through, and then get feedback on how well you're doing. And that's how I'd recommend you develop these skills. So do it in pairs to begin with. But what we did there was always have, if we had a new instructor in the front of the room or teaching a new piece of material, the experienced instructor would sit in the back of the room there with a content expert to support them. Okay? And the same thing is true. When I learned this technique with my partner, he would lead the selling process. He was the expert in the sales. I was the one who would supply the extra content about the product when we needed it. Uh, but basically, uh, I was learning from him, and when I would leave, the, then I'd get an opportunity to leave one, and he'd give me feedback on it. So, that's the best way to do it. All right, we're getting close to time. We've got time for a few more questions on any of the material. Although, if you flip the, uh, if you flip to the last page, <coughs> you can see this diagram. And this was done by one of my classes. And you'll see that Clear Expectations has both the driving and the restraining force. The driving force is that when I interviewed the sales manager, I then interviewed three of the salespeople. Uh, there were the three that were in the office that afternoon, and they were a target of opportunity. So I interviewed them, and all three of them, as well as the sales manager, knew this goal of one sale per salesperson per month. But these were new people. That's a goal. New people have to know information about the activities to be successful. And that was the question that a couple people have asked around. And I reverted back to the fact we don't know the process, then how do we 
clearly defined <coughs> aspect of it. So that was a restraining force. It's hard to give relevant feedback if you don't know what the expectation is. Because really, you're giving feedback on the expectation. So, you know, we, that was a restraining force. They didn't have relevant guides because they didn't have a clearly defined process. Um, the performance management system really didn't promote coaching the way it should have been done. What ended up being, I would coach the sales manager after the meetings. I would attend a meeting every other week until the, the time was up and give him feedback on it. As a matter of fact, at the end of this process, that month we had five sales and we had six salespeople. To meet the goal, he looked at me and said, this is it time. I said, it was time a long time ago. He went out and fired the CEO's brother-in-law. Now we had five sales and five salespeople. <laughs> Be careful how you write your goals, okay? <laughs> but anyway, any this is just a breakdown of how you display that information. And you have a structured way of analyzing, you have a way of displaying and weighting the information. And again, you can use it with an individual, you can process it yourself and give it back to that individual, or you can use it with groups. It's a structure for taking the information that uh, are in the six cells and analyzing it with that. And if you go to the website, you can download the more advanced form. The advanced, more advanced form has not just these one-liners in here, but the same definitions that are in the boxes. And then there's a box for documenting what you looked at. That's why you want the Word version of this thing. I mean, you can handwrite it in, but it's a small box relative speaking, but it expands as you write. Yes? Um. I, I assume that you are either furiously taking notes or using a tape recorder during your interview. Uh, I would never use a tape recorder, but I do take pretty good notes. Um, you never want to go into an interview without being able to take notes. Uh, and it, it, again, that's a third process. Now, when I would go in with my, my old partner, Ken, he wouldn't be taking notes. I'd be taking notes. Okay, and that's why it's good to start with two. Yes. And I would be checking off what we know and what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And then when he turned to me, maybe he's drilled down pretty well in the information cell, but hasn't asked the question on the performance management system and coaching. And so he turned over to me and I, I, I'd ask a question like, uh, you know, do your people, do your sales managers consider themselves coaches? And get them started down that line and talk about it. I'd finish off that cell and then turn it back over to Ken. And we got a complete picture of the cell. Okay, so that's how you move back and forth. There are a lot of those tricks that you'll learn as you go. Yes? This case study has somebody who's in this position. What would you have done if you were to render the decision that he was incapable of this particular role? And he's brought you in. Oh, I run into that all the time. Um, where the person that you're interviewing is the problem. Um, and in real estate, I, my mentor for many years uh, became almost panicked when I told them the solution. The solution isn't a Band-Aid, it's surgery. And uh, like in the case of the real estate brokers we're dealing with, if they had alienated their staff by abandoning them, they were never going to rebuild that personal power base that they needed. They needed to hire a sales manager between them and those people. And we would help them in that process. But we also gave them financial reasons why this would help them both select and retain and train and develop their people so that they become much more profitable. And we had numbers that would show them how much more profitable they would be if they had a sales manager that would give direction, give support, and run an ongoing training program. And the return on investment was two to one based on, but you gotta have that, those type of numbers available to convince people. Good. Okay, I'll be available you know, after this is over, but do fill out the critique forms. And uh, if you just put them on the table over there, uh, I've got brochures and cards up here in the front row if anybody wants them. Questions? Come over here. Happy to talk.